The, in this segment, we'll look briefly at IP strategies. Now, I would note up front that a prerequisite for the IP clinic is that you also take and complete in the Introduction to IP Strategy course. And in that course, we actually look a lot more into the exact strategies that um, small, medium, and large sized companies use with respect to, to their IP. So I, I will not belabor, um, belabor it necessarily within this section, but I do want to touch upon just a few things and some of the big things for you to remember as you proceed forward and actually work within the IP clinic. The first one I think is probably the most important thing as far as a strategy, and that is clarity and sim simplicity often wins out. Now, what I mean by that is that the person often that will go ahead and review your trademark application or your patent application for that matter will be a normal person off the street. It may be a farmer, it may be a teacher, it may be a policeman or a policewoman. It may be, you know, anybody and everybody may actually be on that jury panel. So when we talk about clarity, being clear and being simple and how it is that we are actually providing that protection, it is from that point of view because these individuals are not necessarily those with the legal basis and or training. They have not gone to law school. When you talk about, you know, the, uh, the, the, the legal rhetoric of what is being used, they really do not understand what it is, the, the, the exact nuances of the words uh, from a legal context. They can understand things as, as regular people, how it is that English is being used. But if you're asking them to know exactly, for example, the difference between consisting of or consisting versus comprising of, you know, in patents, there's actually a big difference between those two, two words. But to a normal person on the street, well, consisting of and comprising of are essentially analogous. They are synonymous one with another. So one of the things I would indicate up front is that it is important to be very clear and very simple on how it is that you actually are doing it. This is not a document referring to a patent application or a trademark application that is supposed to be so full of legalese and legal type terms that a person reading it is going to be so amazed by your comprehension of, um, of, of legal type concepts. That is not the goal of a patent application and a trademark application. It's been indicated to me many times in my life that the greatest genius is one who knows how to take the most complex material or subject and teach it in a way that anybody, including a child, can even understand. And I think about that a lot. Patent applications in particular are extremely complex. It's usually very uh, science heavy and it's usually relating to items that people generally would not have access to or even know about. And so it's, it's, it's technically complex, but it's also just legally from a word construction point of view, it also comes across as being extremely complex. And so that is the context that we have here, a very complex document that is then being analyzed by a body of individuals that do not have a legal background. And that's almost you know in conflict one with the other. It's a little bit different on the trademark side in that usually trademark terms are a little bit easier to understand than for example some technical jargon that's being used for biochemical type you know, uh, uh, fabrication or construction. But the reality is that the goals and the principles should be exactly the same. We want to describe things in a clear manner that anybody can understand. So do not be overly complex. The focus should be nice, simple sen sentences that simply describe how it is that things are operating or how it is the names and marks are being used. I should indicate um, that within the trademark sphere that there is importance to actually describe in, in, uh, with being very upfront and clear as to what the goods and services are that are actually being uh, sought as far as the protection. So you can never expand the, the listing unless you re-register for a mark beyond the scope that, it, that has been presented within the original filings. Um, and what I mean by that is that let's say that we have the name um, Lexiker and it's some type of a writing instrument. And Lexiker, we say it would only be used, for example, within a goods or services of a, of a writing utensil. 
Well, what happens later on if now we have a digital stylus that we are also trying to call Lexiker? Well, we would actually have to follow a whole nother trademark with the same exact name for another goods and services. So it's important upfront to be very clear in the goods and services that are actually being sought because you have one time to actually indicate it upfront, else you will, you will have multiple applications, um, each of those focusing on different goods and services later on. On the patent side, and particularly in the um, introduction to IP strategy class, we look at some of the different strategies that can be used, particularly for patents. Core technology, market protection, defensive and offensive type protection as well. Now, sometimes some students go through this material and in their mind they segment out that when they write a patent application, it's going to fall into one of these four buckets. Is this an application that's going to be used offensively? Is this an application that is going to be used you know, to um, position the inventor within the market so that there's more leverage? The reality is that often the patent application falls into all four buckets. The patent application should be constructed in a manner where it could be used to protect core technology. It could be used for market protection, offense, or, or defensive purposes. And I would say 95% of the entire application can be constructed exactly the same, notwithstanding the use of how it is that it is actually used later on. So these strategies often are not necessarily how we actually make the pen application, because as I indicated, about 95% of it will be the same um, as far as the exact type of strategy. It is how it is that it's been used later on that dictates, for example, what your avenues are. Let's give a more concrete example. So I indicated that 95% is kind of the same. And what I mean by that is that the title, the background, the abstract, all that, generally speaking, stays relatively static and the same. The detailed description is where most of the words are within a patent application, and that is where all the details go. So we wanna make sure that there's very good details going through the exact background of what actually has been invented, how is it different from what is out there, and most important, let's talk about the invention itself. What is actually invented? How does it uh, operate? What's its intended use? How, how will it actually be used? Things of that nature. After all that, you get to the last 5%, which is the claim section. And it's the claims that actually define the protection. So the claims you can think of as being a subset of the detailed description. So detailed description, for purposes of our discussion, let's assume it's 100 pages. It's a very robust type of disclosure. And your claims may be two to three pages. So literally two to 3% of everything that was in that patent application may only be represented by claims that may you know, be two to three pages in length. It's not exactly a whole lot. So that 5% would dictate how it is that the patent application is being used thereafter. And it often comes down to the claims. How it is that the claims are being constructed. So for example, let's assume that we have a patent application, that 95% detailed description gives us a very good basis. And you as the company, get a knock on the door. And competitor X comes to you and say, hey, I think that you are infringing our technology and you need to take out a license. Well, before you know, you go and throw your hands in there, you go back and look at your own patent portfolio and you can say, you know what? We have an application that we think is relevant to company X. And we can follow a continuation, track one status. We'll talk about that more later. But track one would allow you to go through the patent process a little bit faster. You pay more money, but you essentially get to cut to the front of the line. And by doing that, that would allow you to target the claims to what it is the competitor X or company X is actually doing. And you may be saying, well, isn't that kind of using hindsight knowledge, namely what company X is doing now to reinvent what actually occurred back in the day? And the answer is no, not at all. 
We are not reinventing here. Let's assume that we have, you know, an invention comprising of elements A, B, and C. And in that 100 pages of material that we have, it describes all the different ways of D. D, you know, let's say, might include some uh, wheels, it might be an airplane wing, it might be a hovercraft, it might be a magnetic field, et cetera, et cetera. So A, B, and C may be the same, but it's D that really may change depending on how it is actually used. And in your initial application, you say, okay, in our claims, we're going to specify A, B, and C, and then in D, we'll specify that it must have wheels. And you get your patent application, you file a continuation application, and later on, company X comes along and actually has A, B, and C, but they're using, let's say, a plane wing. And so a wing of an aircraft. And now company X is coming to, to you and saying, you owe us a, a license. Well, you can actually go back to the patent office, assuming that there is still a pending continuation, and you can refile with a claim that specifies again A, B, and C, but now D shows that it must have an airplane wing. And what you've done is not reinvent what wasn't there already, because the disclosure is 100 pages. And you can go back in into that disclosure and actually take out elements or parts and put them into the claim to show that, that the company X really is infringing what was originally disclosed. So again, we are not reinventing, we're simply taking from that original pot of the disclosure of everything and being able to use any of that to actually redraft the claims now. So the claims simply define the scope of the protection. The claims are our fence, the fence around our property. And if suddenly the competition is coming up and trying to encroach on our fence line, we can suddenly gauge where it is that they are and let's assume that our disclosure, our initial detailed description, covers you know, a full 10 acres. And if the competition is trying to come on any of that 10 acres, even if we only have a small fence around our little home on only a parcel and a part of the, that original 10 acres, if you still have a pending continuation open, you can literally put a fence line on any part of those 10 acres. And that is the power of IP strategies. So you can actually go in and recraft those claims based off of a very thorough disclosure in the detailed description so that you can get a fence line on any part of the property that was originally disclosed. And those claims often are the basis for how it is the patents are used. If you wanna use it offensively, or defensively, often you would be mapping it to a specific company. If you want to be doing it towards uh, market protection, and by offense or defensively, let's say somebody's coming against you or you're going after somebody. In that manner, in both cases, you're doing it against a very particular company. If you're doing a market protection, you are getting the claim set that has applicability to often multiple companies within the market. And if you're doing, let's say, a core technology, that is just looking at the company itself. So claims that would protect our little house on this vast 10 acre property. So 95% of the specification again will be the same. And if you just keep that in mind, a very thorough and robust specification, it's the claims that define the protection, however, that last 5%, and it's those claims they give you the options to how it is that you actually can use the IP as far as asserting patents or defending yourself from um, some, some, some type of licensing arrangement as well. So on the trademark side, you know, obviously the more clear or the more clear that you have actually set up the arrangement as far as goods and services, as far as the words that are being used to describe your mark, et cetera, et cetera. The same principles generally would apply in that the clearer and more simple you are, the easier it is for somebody to actually understand that's in the jury. On the patent side, the clearer your patent is written and the clearer your claims are, the easier it is for somebody that's in the jury to actually um, understand what it is that you are even talking about.